I'm going to turn it over now to Seda Moser. Seda is the senior librarian at our Baldwin Hills Branch Library. She serves on the board of directors for ALS, the Association for Liter Library, Library Service to Children. And she is chair of, notable chair of the Notable Books for Children. Thank you, Seda, for moderating this panel. And I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Janae. Welcome and good morning. Good morning. Whenever I host a program at my branch, I have a saying, those that come are blessed. And I believe that is especially true today. I have the honor of introducing four local children's books authors from right here in Los Angeles. They will be sharing about how they create their work and the importance of representation. So let me introduce the panel. Andrea J. Loney, her most recent title is Curve and Flow. The Elegant Vision of L.A. Architect Paul Williams, illustrated by Keith Mallett. Among her titles is the award-winning Double Bass Blues, illustrated by Rudy Gutierrez, both published by Alfred A. Knopf. Next, Sharon E. Langley, author of A Ride to Remember, A Civil Rights Story, illustrated by Floyd Cooper, and published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Next. Don Swaby's upcoming title is It'll Be Irene, Staying True to Yourself, illustrated by Alejandra Barajas. It will be published by Cardinal Rural Press out July 1st. Next, Glenda Armand. Her most recent title is All Aboard the School Train, a little story from the Great Migration, illustrated by Keisha Morris and published by Scholastic. Among her other titles, Black Eyed Peas and Hog Head Cheese, a story of food, family, and freedom, illustrated by Steffi Walthall and published by Crown Books for Young Readers. Let's welcome our esteemed panel. All right. Would each of you like to share what inspired you to write for children? How did you become an author? Take it, panel. Okay, so I'll start. I'm Andrea J. Loney, and um, I actually decided I wanted to write children's books when I was a second grader, and we had to move to a new town halfway through the school year, and I was scared of everybody, and I was shy, but books made me feel good. Make, books made me feel like I had a friend. Um, that somebody cared about me. So I decided at that age, when I grow up, I'm gonna write children's books. And it took me like maybe another like 40 years to make that happen, but it happened. So um, the first question, actually I'll answer the second question first. Um, as far as uh, writing, I was inspired to write at a really young age, um, according to my uh, Aunt uh, Peggy in Canada, when I was like five years old, uh, visiting her with my family, she said, and you cut out these pieces of paper I gave you, and you went away, and you wrote this little story, and you came back, and you had pictures, and you told this whole story at five years old. So um, that's probably the first time I started writing stories. Uh, and uh, as far as children's uh, books uh, in particular, um, I fell in love with children's books a second time. Uh, I was a volunteer uh, through the Screen Actors Guild as an actor. Uh, uh, it's a now defunct program called the Book Pals Program. You volunteer to go read to, to kids. And that's how I rediscovered the whole world of children's books and how magical and wonderful, and to the point where, as a writer, I got so inspired, I started uh, thinking of uh, stories myself. And that's when I fell in love with actually writing uh, children's book stories as well. Good morning, I'm Sharon Langley. Um, I would say writing for children came in a few phases, partly because I was such an avid reader. Um, I loved Beverly Cleary, and Ramona the Pest was one of my favorite books. I could not wait to find out about her next adventure. Um, probably Patricia Polacco because she 
told stories about her growing up, about her childhood, about her family, about the people that um, were in her community. So it made me think that ordinary stories, ordinary happenings were important, even though they were simple. Um, and then later, I became an elementary teacher and a literacy coach for elementary. And it made me realize how many stories there were yet to be told, how many stories were maybe within me uh, that I wanted to share. Uh, good morning, I'm Glenda Armand, and I think I came about it pretty naturally. We found out, um, my siblings and I found out that my dad, who was a street cleaner with an eighth grade education, <clears throat> was actually in World War II, and while he was uh, stationed in the Philippines, he wrote 200, over 200 letters home to my mom, who was his fiance at the time. And then we learned what a beautiful writer he was. We were adults, and in fact, I have another sister who's a writer, and she's compiling those letters into a book. So I think the, the writing part came naturally, and I'm an elementary school teacher also and a school librarian, and so I've always worked with children, so it never occurred to me to write for adults. It always occurred to me to write for children. That's, that's my story. All right. Now, would each of you give us some insight into your creative process, how you develop your ideas, how you approach writing for various age groups? How do you bring your stories to life? Okay, so I'll start. Um, well, first of all, uh, I studied writing for a very long time. In high school, I was in an arts high school um, writing poetry and plays. I went to New York University and I majored in dramatic writing and I got my BFA and my MFA. And when I even moved to Los Angeles, I took different writing classes at UCLA. But really what it comes down to for me personally is an idea comes to me and I'm like, I'll remember that, I'll remember that. And sometimes I do remember that. And when it keeps coming back to me, that's when I know I think I should do something about this. And when it wakes me up in the middle of the night or it comes to me in the shower or whatever, I'm like, okay, we have to do this. It's not gonna leave us alone. And then I just start imagining everything I can about that idea, and just kind of swirl around in a possibilities. And when I decide what I want it to be about, I outline things. Some writers are um, plotters, where they outline things and then write. Some writers are pantsers, where they just kind of write stuff and see what happens. Evidently, I pants in my head and then plot on <laughs> paper. And, um, and then I just keep churning stuff out, trying not to think, is this good? Is this not good? But is this complete? Is this what I want to say? And then I take it to my um, critique partners, some of whom are right here. And I show them and get their feedback on it. And then I take it to another critique group. And I can tell people in here. Yeah. Um, we have one critique group that's all people of color. All people of color. And then I'm in another critique group that has mostly white women, but they're also, some of them are illustrators. So that way I get to see my story from many different points of view before it goes to my agent in New Jersey and before it goes to you know the editors in New York. So I try to just like, I start out with big possibilities and bring them down, show them to different people and then send them out from there. And then I start working on the next thing and I don't sit and wonder what's going to happen. With, you could spend all your time doing that and then you wouldn't be writing. So wait a minute, you've been double timing us with another critique group? I didn't know this. <laughs> no, I'm just playing with um, it. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, uh, as Andrea said, we are, uh, uh, Sharon and I and, and Andrea are part of a, an awesome critique group. Um, and as far as my particular journey, uh, so I'm a multi-genre writer, which is to say that I write in several different genres, um, uh, picture books, uh, children's middle grade. Um, I also write screenplays that I've been writing for about 30 years. And uh, I also uh, 
I still write occasionally stage plays, um, working on a musical version, for example, of my picture book, and because I'm also a musician, uh, and uh, I'm also uh, trying to shop a sci-fi TV series. So uh, it's kind of across the board. And um, as far as my uh, process, as far as I, uh, ideas and stuff, um, yeah, because I'm a multi-genre writer, and because literally I went from going, you know, writing poetry to uh, uh, I wrote my first play in junior high, um, in high school I was writing uh, more poetry, essays, uh, short stories, and then college more plays, screenplays, and all of that. So, um, but my process is the same, which is to say that just like Andrea, you have an idea, you just something that comes to you. You don't know where it comes from. Um, and we can debate, you know, so he'll say, oh, well, it comes from the, 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 the author or the writer or the artist, right? And, and uh, some artists are like, well, it comes from somewhere else, the universe, God, I don't, I don't know. It just, it just comes, and I'm this vehicle. Um, and like you said, when it's a persistent idea, it starts to, 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 to uh, uh, get good to you, right? It's like, hey, I, this is a good, uh, a good idea. Um, and then for me, I start writing. I'm a pantser. I guess I didn't, I just learned that term, a pantser, which is to say, you know, I just kind of like at the beginning, whatever comes out, like whatever thoughts, ideas, words, images, whatever, I, uh, characters, uh, something that somebody says even, you know, just little dribs and pieces of things. Uh, until that starts to amass, and then eventually there is a tipping point. There's a point where I start to say, you know what? Okay, yeah. Let me let me let me get a, let me go to my computer, or let me get a you know uh, uh, and start typing this in, and let me actually start shaping this um, uh, into something. Um, and again, because I'm a multi-genre writer, of course, every genre has its own particular set of rules, uh, format, and the whole nine yards. And so for me, part of my process as a writer, uh, professional writer. Um, the last, you know, uh, several uh, uh, decades has been uh, really, really uh, 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 trying to, you know, getting a first, uh, respecting the genre and getting it down as far as, you know, uh, it's the format and style and everything. Um, but yeah, that's that's the the process, and then that, like I said, shaping it, and and oh, and of course our ever uh, uh, important critique group, um, which again, as to other writers, I mean, I would you can't stress this enough that you do need uh, a third eye, uh, uh, outside uh, uh, feedback, uh, and the best place to do it is not your family or friends. Your mom is you may not be the most you know impartial person. You need uh, a critique group of your peers. I'm gonna take us way back, way on back. Um, I've probably been writing since elementary school, writing poems. I had one teacher in third grade who used to stay after school with me and let me read my poems to her. <laughs> I haven't thought about Miss Corvera in a really long time, but having someone who is available to listen to what you've read, um, at that stage I think it was probably encouragement, you know, and having an audience. Um, and before the internet became uh, as widely available, my mother used to, this is going to take us way back. We can go. My mom <laughs> used to cut out articles in the newspaper and in magazines, and she would say, I think this is something you should write about. So I have my own clippings. <laughs> I have my own vertical file then, right? Now, probably I am inspired in part by events in my own family. Remember I talked about Beverly Cleary and Patricia Polacco because they wrote about personal experiences. So I would say half of my story ideas come from thinking about my childhood events and the people who were important to me. And the ones that I think have appeal, like someone would see themselves in that event, maybe that is one that kind of persists with me. Um, the other ones happen to be people or events that I am interested in. Now they mentioned that we're in a critique group together I also have another critique group. <laughs> but <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to break it to you in such a uh, public setting. <laughs> no, they knew. Um, but the composition of the two groups is very different. The one group, uh, authors 
uh, of color and illustrators of color. The other group um, actually happens to be women who are younger, who uh, have small children, and what kinds of books and stories they are interested in and would choose for their children. Um, and I get different kinds of feedback from the different groups, right? Because maybe a story for, um, from my childhood as uh, a black girl might not be exactly the same um, as the, the, the group that is mostly uh, white women, but maybe there is an interest or maybe there's a universal thread that c causes them to think, yeah, I would be interested in a story about this, and here's where it resonates with me. Um, I have started recently, I don't cut things out of magazines as much as I used to. I make notes to myself on my phone. I do screenshots uh, and save them and go back to them. Um, and if it kind of sticks with me, then they'll kind of hear about it. Well, I, th I got started just by writing for my students, for my, if there's a family member who has a birthday coming up, I'll write them a poem. I wrote plays for my students to act out. And when I, um, the first um, book I had published came, it was, I wrote about Frederick Douglass. I was about to go from teaching second grade to teaching eighth grade. You know, in June I was a second grade teacher, in September I was gonna be an eighth grade teacher. And so I said, and history. And so I decided, well, I better brush up on my history. Uh, English and history, the English was okay, the history. Uh. So I decided to reread um, Frederick Douglass's autobiography. And in that autobiography, he talks about, um, he wrote three autobiographies, a lot of people don't know that. So um, some people say, he didn't write that, as, not in that one, not in the first one. The first, his uh, first autobiography was, had a purpose, and that was to talk about how horrible slavery was. And, but l later on, he wrote two more, and he could look more fondly back at some of the, the things in his childhood that were good, and one of those was his mother. Um, she, he lived 12 miles away from her, and at night, after she worked in the cornfields as a slave all day, she would sometimes walk the 12 miles to visit him on another farm and spend what, about an hour with him and then walk 12 miles back. And so uh, the name of that book is Love 12 Miles Long. And so I wrote that this, you know, the first time I read that book, I was probably in junior high. But the second time, you know, I was a, a mother and a teacher and a wife and all those things. And so that, that, that story of him, of him and his mother at night really hit home. And so I wrote just about one evening, uh, one night of her visit. When, and she didn't visit that many times and she didn't live to see him grow up. But he said that um, when I sat upon my mother's knee, I was like a king upon a throne. I was not just a child, I was somebody's child. But anyway, so that was my first published book. And um, so I would say most of my ideas do come from reading. Um, from reading about Frederick Douglass, I learned about Ira Aldridge. I had never heard about him. Uh, the first black person to um, play um, Othello on the English stage. And then sometimes people give me ideas. I have, when I get ideas or someone gives me ideas, I I'm, I'm put them on a list. And so right now I've got about 40 titles on that list, which I'll never write, you know. But if I, my well ever runs dry, I'll, I'll go to the list. But usually I don't have to go to that list. And I have to say I'm not in a critique group <laughs> at all. And um, I have a sister who's a retired librarian, and she's my critic. And she's very tough, and she makes it a point to find something wrong. And I always try to make it a point to make it perfect, but she always finds something. And she's and we fight, and she's usually right. And then I revise, and then you know. so she's the only one other than and then my agent uh, reads it, and um, that's how I've, that's how I've done. But I've never been in a group. Sorry. <laughs> you can join us. All right, panel. Now please share the importance of diversity in children's literature and how you promote a diverse representation in your work. And I'm gonna invite you to share a brief sample of your work if you would like.
because I was an elementary teacher for many years and my classroom was multicultural, multilingual, and otherwise diverse, when I thought about this story, um, I thought about not just my family uh, and their role as activists, but I also thought about those who were allies, those who disagreed with segregation and who were willing to make a stand. And it was very important to me to have them included. Um, if you ever see the actual photographs that this spread is based on, you realize that it's a multicultural group of people who are persisting, right? And that's important. You know, we're in an age right now where we're talking about book bans, um, book removals, uh, reduction of access to books about specific topics. And it's very important to show that there are people who are on the right side of an issue, even if that issue does not personally affect them. Those are the allies. And they're out there, and they have been. So I imagined, I visualized reading this book to my former students. And what would I say to my students who were not black? Would I be able to point them to people of good conscience and good courage who made a stand? And could I show them that they could identify with those people who took a stand, rather than feeling that all people of some particular group stood by and did nothing while another group was being um, mistreated or mishandled or being excluded? Let's see, I mean, diversity is, diversity has become more and more important to me in literature the further I get along in my writing career and also in my teaching career, because I too am a teacher, there's lots of teachers here. Um, next year is my 20th year as an educator and I mostly teach adults um, computer classes and corporations. But um, around the same time that I started writing children's books, which I would say would be about like um, 2012, I also started substitute teaching K-12 in Los Angeles. And I was substitute teaching in the jail system, uh, Men's Central, Twin Towers, CDR CRDF, all of them. And, and I brought my children's books with me to show people. And what I saw by looking at, like at least in Los Angeles, the educational system from like kindergarten to a corporation or kindergarten to a cell at Men's Central was a lot of people who either felt like this world was made for them and they belonged here or people who felt like they weren't really ever supposed to fit into the world and they'd never seen um, a positive representation of themselves as a child. Like my grandma taught me how to read when I was three because a few years before I was born, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats came out, um, the little black boy in the red hoodie in the snow. And you know, she was a kid in the 30s and they, I think the only book they might have had that had black kids in it at that point was like what, Topsy from Uncle Tom's Cabin or um, Little Black Sambo. And uh, she was so excited to like show me this and put me on her lap and say, look, this is a book about you. This is a book about you. We belong here in literature. So I was really lucky to have that, but I know that a lot of kids don't have that. And I want more of them to have that feeling like, yes, you belong in this world of stories so that they might feel less tempted to act out later in life out of a feeling of not being included in society. Um, so, uh, when I was uh, a child growing up and, and reading, um, 
uh, and watching television and watching movies. Um, to be honest, my own personal experience, uh, I certainly, as a child, was not thinking about the word diversity uh, and, 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 or inclusion. Um, and to be honest, nor was I necessarily, or at least consciously, looking for a face that resembled mine. Um, I loved all kinds of stories, and I read everything, picture books from The Five Chinese Brothers, which is actually one of the controversial books, uh, which it should not be, because uh, it, it, it takes place in imperial China, and they dress that way, yes. Um, so the book is not racist, my personal opinion. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I just loved stories. I loved stories in television and film. I grew up in the 80s, uh, the Cosby Show, Positive Black Role Models. So I did not feel like, oh, I'm, I'm not seeing myself. Uh, I did not feel that. Um, however, uh, as a writer and as an artist contributing to uh, art to the society, um, I am of Jamaican descent. Um, uh, both my parents are from Jamaica. I'm Jamaican-American. And I realized as a young adult that um, uh, the, the specific African-American experience and the Caribbean-American experience are not exactly the same thing, um, which is to say that, that we, from the Caribbean culture, uh, uh, because we're coming from a different culture, you know, yes, there is a common root, of course. Um, and, but yet it's a different thing. So um, that became important to me as I got older, um, which uh, led to uh, the creation of this particular uh, book, my first uh, traditionally published book. Um, my first published book is a self-published book that I actually illustrated myself uh, as well, called You're Everything, Everywhere, All the Time. Um, and with that book, as well as other books uh, uh, and things that I've written with characters, um, I have written characters that looked like me. Um, this little boy, uh, I did not have an afro that big <laughs> in the 70s, late 70s, but uh, I you know, looked similar in that sense. In fact, there's a picture of the little boy hugging his parents, and you know, those are my parents, for example. Um, and with this book, uh, uh, this is my traditionally published book, out July 1st, it'll be Irie, uh, which is uh, an immigrant story. It's about a little boy who moves from Jamaica, the island, uh, to Jamaica, Queens in New York. Um, and that was important for me to represent uh, my culture in, in that way uh, and, uh, uh, and share that uh, uh, to the uh, conversation in that way and have uh, people be able to, uh, children be able to at least visually uh, see uh, something that represents uh, them. And just one other little thing really quickly, because um, I can't help it, I gotta say this. Um, I, as an artist, also am pushing back against what I call the PCism. Um, I am against the banning of books on uh, on all spectrums. I mean, uh, uh, books should not be banned, um, whether it be Little House on the Prairie or, or any other book. Um, but I'm also against um, this idea that, that authors and artists have to stay in their lane. And by that, what I'm saying is, uh, as a writer, I uh, am fascinated by many cultures. Uh, uh, I write about ancient civilizations, for example, um, uh, uh, going thousands of years back. So uh, anything that I write, I, I bring a, a lot of respect to. If I'm writing about where the, the, the main character is, let's say, a Mayan girl, uh, I have a picture book uh, that I'm still uh, 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 trying to get sold, uh, where it's, it's like a, a sort of a Mayan mythology. It's inspired by that, and I love uh, mythology. Um, but I myself am not Mayan, and yet I suspect in this right now, there's such a PC thing going on, not just in the literary world, which is honestly nauseating, it's sickening me, um, as well as the acting world, but this idea that, um, uh, that people of color are policing each other, and I don't like it. I do not like it, um, uh, uh, because I get it that, that, yes, we want people from those cultures to represent those cultures. I understand that a thousand percent. But what I don't understand is uh, 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 taking an artist and, and, and straight jacketing them by saying, well, no, you, you have to write you know, characters and everything that are specifically from your culture. So for example, that would mean that I can only write about like you know, people from the Caribbean. I couldn't write a, a, a book uh, where somebody's African American, for example, because that's not my specific uh, uh, identity or experience. Uh, and I, I disagree with that. I think that people's experience uh, and, is, and what they bring to it, despite what their skin color might be, uh, 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 is of value and needs to be uh, included.
Um, yeah, I agree that uh, children should be able to see each other and to see themselves in the book. And we have, uh, we use this phrase, windows and mirrors. And so when uh, when I read a book to a child, I'd say, I'll say, is this, um, how is this book a mirror to you? How did you see yourself in this book? And it might be, um, for instance, I read um, Love 12 Miles Long, where the mother can't live with the child. Um, um, one um, white parent told me that they used that book with their uh, daughter because the, the dad was a, an airline pilot and they're not home, he's not home that much. And so he could, she could relate in that way. And then I asked the child, you know, how was it a, um, a window? How, what did you learn about other people from this book? So I just want um, us to learn from, to see ourselves and to, and to learn about each other in the books that I write. And, um, you know, my experience was my mom uh, grew up in uh, Louisiana. Her first language was Creole. And so, and, and I relate to a lot of my uh, students are Hispanic. And um, their dad, used it, and often, it's often that the dad comes to, to the United States, he establishes a home and gets a job that he sends for the rest of the family. Well, that's what happened with my family. My dad came from Louisiana to California moved in with my aunt, aunt and uncle, you know, found the job, then he sent for my mom and the four of us. So we, so we relate, and then when I tell them, well, my mom, uh, her, her native language was not English. They, you know, they're amazed, and, they, and they, there's a connection there. It's that, um, and also, when I, a lot of my books are set during slavery times, but I also like for children and uh, adults to know that not all blacks were slaves at that time. In fact, um, my book, Ira, he was born in 1808 in, in New York. He was born free. Uh, however, he was almost sold into slavery when he was a teenager because he went down south uh, without, he ran away. And he was al almost sold. He never would have been um, heard from again. Um, he was, the, the captain of the boat was offered $500 for him. And he could have taken that money and there would never have been an Ira Aldridge. But luckily this was a, a good man who did not do that. But the, um, even those who were enslaved had such different experiences. And um, I have another book called Ice Cream Man about Augustus Jackson who came up with the idea of using rock salt to make ice cream. He was an entrepreneur in, um, in, in Philadelphia and he, be, um, he became wealthy. Um, as, but it was during slavery time. He, he also worked as a chef in the White House, uh, but he was never a slave. Um, so it's just been, there's just a very diverse um, culture uh, among black people that um, I hope our books show. And I'm going to put my two cents in, Glenda, with your book, Black Eyed Peas and Hoghead Cheese, because the characters in that book is the grandmother and the granddaughter. And my grandmother was the one that introduced me to hoghead cheese. And just like the girl in the book, I don't like it either. <laughs> so when I was reading it, I was like, this story is so true to me. So I just wanted to add my two cents on that one. All righty. Now, panel. Would you discuss your experiences working with publishers, illustrators, agents, navigating the publishing industry as black authors? Okay, so um, the first time I tried to write children's books, I want to say it was like about 2003. I had been writing screenplays. I think I was working at Disney at that point. And my sister had, a, she had a kid, she had a three-year-old, and he was endlessly fascinating to us, so of course I wanted to write stories for him. So I wrote like maybe like six stories, and all of them got rejected, and that was back in the days where you had to mail them back and forth and all this other stuff, and I said, oh, they said no six times, I guess I'm not meant to do this. And it took me like another 11 years to say, you know what, people are gonna say no, and I'm gonna keep going. So I kept going with that. Thank you. Totally forgot what the question is. <laughs> Your experiences navigating agents. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the difference was with the second time was that um, I took it very seriously. I joined the Society of Children's Book Authors and Illustrators, and um, I kind of gave myself almost like a second MFA in children's books. I spent so much time here 
and many of the other 72 branches of the LA Public Library and the Burbank Library and the Santa Monica Library, reading all the books that I could and figuring out kind of what worked in reverse engineering them. And I applied for the Lee and Lowe New Voices Award competition, and they are an amazing publisher that are so devoted to making books by, about, and for children of color. And I didn't win, but I didn't give up. And then I tried it again the next year, and that book won, and usually they have a winner and an honor, and that was the only book chosen, and it was Take a Picture of Me, James Vanderzee, about the um, Harlem photographer, James Vanderzee. And the cool thing is, Glenda had also won that contest um, with Love 12 Miles Long. So when I actually got to meet her at an SCBWI event, I'm like, rock star! I was so excited. And, um, and I like talked her ear off and I just wanted to find out what other people did. I try to learn from what other people do and then, you know, I'll either do that or I won't do that. But I, I you know, I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel with everything because it takes, I don't want my creativity to go to logistics. I want my creativity to go to my writing. So I got an agent after that book was sold, after the James Vanderzee book was sold. And the next book that sold was um, Bunny Bear. Um, which is a band book, and it's about a bear. <laughs> it's a band book about a bear who believes in his heart that he's a bunny. And the thing is, I have these two books, and the James Vanderzee book was the 11th book I'd written. I'd gotten like at least, I don't know, like 25 rejections, and that, but I kept going. Um, when I met agents, I needed to find somebody who would represent me for something like a James Vanderzee book, but would also represent me for a Bunny Bear book, because I was really worried about being only able to tell kind of like what Don was talking about. Um, and it's really fun to listen to you talk. My dad's Panamanian Jamaican, and my mom's family's been in the U.S. since like the 1700s. So Don, every time he talks, he like reminds me of like my parents' conversations. But... Um, and go Jamaica, Queens, right? So you spend my summers there. So um, anyway, lost the thread again. Yeah, I need to find somebody who would represent all aspects of my writing because I didn't want to be one of the authors of color. And this happens to lots of authors of color. I, I have Asian friends who have this happen with. and. Um, Hispanic Latino friends who this is happening with, where people like expect you to write one type of story about one particular time period. And if you love it, that's great. But I want to write about the universe. That's part of why I wrote Abby in Orbit, which is set in 2051 on the International Space Station. And it's a little Afro-Latina girl and her family. Her mom's Panamanian, like my dad's Panamanian. And her best friend is... Um, a girl of Chinese descent from Canada, and her best friend of me is a boy who speaks Russian, who may be from Russia or maybe from Ukraine. And um, everybody else is from all these different countries, and like just the whole world is there. And I'm so excited to be able to talk about the future, but I wasn't gonna get that right off the bat. I wrote other books. I wrote um, The Double Bass Blues, which won the um, Caldecott honor for my um, illustrator, for the illustrator, Rudy Gutierrez. Yeah, that was really cool. I was, I'm still excited about that. It was. And, and pardon? It was. It was really cool. It was really cool. It was. And um, I got to a point where none of the manuscripts I was writing were selling, none of the picture books I was writing were selling. And one thing that I had done when I was in the film and television industry and none of my screenplays were selling and I got really heartbroken about the whole thing, I sat down and I just wrote a novel. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't, I didn't even want it to be good. I just wanted to prove to myself that just because these people say no doesn't mean that I don't get to write. So when my picture books weren't selling and the pandemic came and I couldn't make money from doing my author visits to different schools, um, I wrote an entire novel, another novel. This one worked out a little bit better. And my agent didn't necessarily want to go out with that novel, but she took the fact that I could write something that was 70,000 words of moving people's hearts in some way or another and pitched me for other projects. So I ended up writing a 10,000 word biography of Stacey Abrams called VIP Stacey Abrams, and that was with HarperCollins. 
And, um, and that's how I got the Abbey in Orbit um, series. And this is the first book that came out in November. And the third book comes out in August. And the fifth book comes out the year after. The fourth book comes yeah, There's more books. We just, we, we just keep going. But basically, I, I try to write as much as I can. I try to be mindful that everything I'm writing about is a kid, usually a black kid, but not always. Sometimes it's a bear who feels like they don't fit in in the world that they're in because they're made to stand out in some way. And it's all about authenticity. It's all about, it's all about being yourself. So all of that, yeah, all of that is really important to me. And that means that I get offered um, projects that are kind of in that vein. And that makes a big difference as well. And if I ever get into a situation where there's cultural issues with my um, editors or publishing, you know, them not understanding African-American life and saying this or whatever, uh, I have now learned that I talk to my agent who is white, I talk to her and I say, can you please tell them X, Y, Z? And she talks for me so that I'm not the angry black girl in the room. And that has been very effective. And yeah, I just kind of, I play the game in that way, but I'm just really super grateful. And I'm grateful to have like amazing critique partners who, you know, help me not put wild stuff out there that isn't, that isn't helpful. And, um, and I'm really grateful for the writing community at large. Um, the children's book community at large is very, um, they're very gracious, they're very loving in a lot of ways. They're very supportive of each other. And because of that, I get to travel around the country sharing books with kids who will look at me and think I'm just a librarian or a teacher, because I do have a teacher voice. Um, and like, no, 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 I wrote this book. And then I show them, oh, it's not in this one. I show them my picture in the book, in the back of the book, here we go. Yeah, I show them the picture, like, no, no, it's really me. I'm wearing the same necklace. And especially if it's a, um, if it's a young black child, they always do the same thing. They look at the book, they look at this picture of me, they look at my face, and then they do this really cool thing where they look inward, they look at themselves. Because they're like, well, if she could do that, what could I do? And I love that, that's part of why I'm a teacher, but that's also why I write these books. And I'm just happy that the industry allows me to be able to do these things. Going to order mm -hmm. or you the question, to... um, working with illustrators, the, uh, you know, how to navigate the publishing industry. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go next. Um, uh, so basically, my, my experience is uh, a little shorter uh, in terms of uh, agents and publishers in the kidlit world. Um, I actually, as an, as an actor, of course, have had uh, agents and managers as an actor uh, since I was in my 20s um, and still do. Um, uh, but the elusive literary uh, agent, yeah, it, it seems to very, it seems to be elusive to me. Uh, so I'm currently unagented when it comes to uh, writing, um, and uh, just in terms of submissions and all of that. Um, it, w some observations. Um, it seems to me that the majority of the uh, people in Kidlet are are of the female female gendered. Uh, number one. Um, again, this is observation isn't like this is not, it's not bad or good or anything like that. Um, and then the majority of those women are uh, Caucasian women. Um, and that's mostly, it seems most of the agents are that. So um, I don't really know, or I, I have not been able to gauge um, uh, uh, what, for example, uh, they may feel about uh, uh, me as a, or as a uh, writer submitting something, as I said, that is not of the culture that I am outwardly. So for example, my Mayan uh, picture book um, still is yet to uh, find a home. And, and uh, even though I've gotten a lot of, some resp great response from it from some people in the industry, um, I'm thinking maybe it's not being sold because again, they look at me, they go, well, this guy's not of Mayan descent or he's not you know, South American or whatever. So you know, I think they stay away. And I think, like I said, there is a PCism that um, that is, uh, it seems to be pervasive uh, there. Um, my books, uh, this uh, particular book, as I said, that was self-published, um, 
this book actually uh, was my attempt to teach children quantum physics, <laughs> the idea that, that they are everything and that uh, 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 anything and everything in the entire universe, uh, they're connected to that, um, and that uh, all things are made of the same stuff eventually, so you know they are everything, everywhere, all the time. Um, uh, which is not to be confused by the awesome movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which, yes, I did see the huge <laughs> coincidence, and I was like, hey, wait a minute. And whoever, and if you've seen the movie, there is actually a scene where a character holds up a picture book and talks about, like, yeah, exactly. So I know, it's, it's weird. But um, uh, this book, uh, uh, It'll Be Irie, as I said, um, uh, was published by Cardinal Rule Press, which is a smaller publisher, but they are small but mighty, which is to say um, I, uh, they are very, very dedicated to their mission of sharing books that not only uh, empower kids, uh, illuminate, and educate. Uh, very big on that. Um, and just a little excerpt, just so you can hear um, that this is a different book. By different, um, the little boy is, again, Jamaican. So I wrote it with a Jamaican uh, he speaks in Jamaican patois. It's, it's a little bit uh, toned down because it is a picture book and we want the kids to understand. So, um, but I will just read the first couple of pages. Um, you want me to hold the book for you? Oh, sure. Okay. I am moving to America. And when pops and mama tell me, I know right away what to do. Just wait until everyone see how American I can be. I start researching at my cousin Percy house. Uncle Phil have a whole heap of movies, American movies, but they're older, so we use what Percy call ancient technology. So, uh, and, and, and he means by ancient technology, there's a, a picture of, of them uh, uh, watching a movie on a VCR. Um, okay, so that gives you an example of that. Thank you. So my relationship with editors and agents, I have one agent, I've had just one agent who's really good. Um, she, she knows me, I'm a little bit conservative, I'm a little old fashioned, but, but she, she knows I am, but she's not, so she can, like, she, she's, my <laughs> she's my go between with the real world. Um, and I got her, at, and at, um, Andrea mentioned SCBWI, which is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is how I got my start when I started going, going to the, their conventions and their, their workshops. Because I tell, um, when students ask me about becoming a writer, and I tell them, a lot of them know how to write, are good at it, and I've always written, but I didn't know the rules of the game. So I say, so if you're, if, you know, if you're really tall and you know how to bounce a ball and you know how to run fast, but you don't know the rules of basketball, you can't play, you're not gonna be a good player, you have to learn the rules. And there are a lot of rules in writing for children. You know, how long is a picture book? How many words should it be? Do you have a hook at the end of each line? Uh, who's your audience? What age group? So I, when I was writing my little heart out, I didn't know any of that stuff. And, and um, so there's a rude awakening and you get a lot of rejections, but there are good rejections and bad rejections. I just got a rejection last week, actually. I'm still getting rejections. I have wow. 10 books published and I'm still getting rejections. But it was a good one because they, uh, you know, she said why she, um, she was passing on it and um, what, what I needed to do. So when they give, usually it's, you don't hear from them. But if you hear from them and they give you some advice, you take it. You know, you, at least you take it to heart. And whether you uh, agree with it or not. If you don't agree, then you go and you look for another person. But sometimes they have, they have good ideas. So, um, so yeah, I have my agent and I figure if she, when she retires, I just won't, I won't have an agent. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'll just go directly with the editors because now that you, when we have a, a relationship with editors, but it's good to have an agent to get in and most um, houses won't look at your work unless, you, unless it's from an agent. Um, with the illustrators, uh, my first two books, I didn't even know who the illustrator was. They didn't ask me anything. But after that, they start asking, your editor asks you, do you have any ideas for who you would like to illustrate the book? And then, and then by now you know people, and so you, so you have more input. And, the, and the, the illustrator pretty much works alone. Sometimes they'll ask a question through the editor um, about something. I remember when um, 
left 12 miles long, he wanted to know if Frederick Douglass's mom would have been wearing shoes uh, when she walked the 12 miles to, uh, to visit her son. And um, I said, yes, she would, she would be wearing shoes. So that kind of thing. But usually, um, I don't tell the illustrators what to, to do. It's, all, it's, it's their work. And, and I've been very, really lucky with illustrators. Um, I don't know if you want me to read now, or we're going to go around and read. Uh, let's just go over to Miss Langley, if we can. This is going to be our last question panel. I'm going to say that publishing is probably like most industries in the sense that, yes, you absolutely should know the rules, and I am still learning. But I would also say be open to a little serendipity and be open to the idea that something may happen for you that is not within the rules. So um, during the pandemic, uh, I was working from home, and as an edit, I mean, as an educator, of course, normally I would be at school. Normally I would be on campus. But at that time, I was at home, and all of my work was being conducted virtually. So that meant that I didn't have a commute to and from work, which gave me two additional hours at home, which meant more time to write. Um, I wasn't ready to submit, I didn't think, but it gave me more time to switch my brain. I almost, <laughs> I read the book to some students at school, and I realized that that was my other persona. When I am at school and when I am at work, I'm probably more like Clark Kent, <laughs> and I don't um, do the presto changeo until I am the author at an author visit, right? So it was kind of hard to have my author persona at work. Why am I saying that? Because that also uh, involves my creativity. When I am at work, I'm doing this. When I'm at home and I'm writing, I'm doing this. So getting those two hours back was really helpful. And I found that I had more time to switch my mind off of the things that uh, took up my time during the day, the things that I worried about at school, the students, the concerns, the problems. And I had time to, to devote to my own creative process. So what does that mean? It means that you have more time to explore the topics that you want to write about. Everybody here has talked about writing something that was uh, rejected or not accepted. It actually doesn't mean that it isn't a good idea and that you shouldn't persist with it. You know, I really truly do not like peas. I have not liked them since I was a child. And I sat at the table until the peas were cold. Why? Because I, I really just didn't like them. And so finally my mom decided, you know, you're basically a good eater. You eat everything else I serve, but you really don't like peas, so it's okay. And after a while, she didn't serve them to me. He said, well, where'd you, where, where'd that come from? Everything is not for everybody. Everybody will not see th what you see in a story that you love. It does not mean that it isn't a good story. And it also doesn't mean that it won't find a publishing home. So if you strongly believe in it, I agree. Take the feedback. You might incorporate it or you might say, hmm, I still see it this way and just sort of tuck it in your pocket for later, right? Um, and knowing the rules. How many words is a picture book? How many spreads? Who is the age group? Is the vocabulary age and grade accessible, right? And if it's not, would you like to write it for a slightly older audience, young adult or middle grade? Um, and then be open to the serendipity of it all. Um, belonging to organizations like SCBWI, you meet other kid-lit people who share their processes and experiences with you, and you can tuck that in your pocket. Um, participating in uh, other organizations that sponsor 
um, like uh, 12 by 12, where we endeavor to write <laughs> 12 picture books in 12 months. That takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of flexibility of thought, right? Because you're, you're constantly mining your ideas and refining them. Um, submitting your ideas to, um, I wouldn't call them contests, but I would call them uh, opportunities for critiques. Now, <laughs> your critique partners, after a while, may know the types of things that you write and the types of topics that you are interested in. But if you submit to someone that you have not met before and they don't know you personally, sometimes their feedback may be um, objective and insightful in a way that you hadn't thought about. I submitted something not too long ago. Not only did, was I asked to write that particular topic, but my name was passed on to someone else who said, hey, I got your name from thus and so, and I would like to know if you're available to write for hire. So I say, know the rules, play by them, but be open to the possibility that it might just come about in a different way. Thank you, panel. Sadly, this is the end of our panel discussion. Thank you guys for blessing us with your knowledge. Let's give them a hand, guys. Now, their books, they can be checked out with your Los Angeles Public Library card. Okay, get them there in the collection. You can also purchase them on Amazon or wherever you buy books. So thank you. Oops. Thank you, panel.